Welcome to the Monday edition of Dividend Cafe. We are doing a real traditional Monday Dividend Cafe today, going around the horn with a little bit of every category. We have a against doomsdayism. We have the uh, normal market recap, Fed, housing, public policy, all of the fun things. I do want to encourage those of you um, that missed Dividend Cafe from yours truly, David Bonson, on Friday. Uh, about the Fed, I think you um, will find it to be a reasonably helpful synopsis of what the Fed did and what uh, the appropriate commentary is around it regarding the markets, the economy, and what we're expecting next year. Check out Friday's Dividend Cafe about the Fed. Market today uh, was reasonably uneventful. The Dow opened up 70. It closed up almost 70. It did go down 100 a couple times along the way and then just kind of leveled out. It hit an all-time high in the middle of the day. The S&P closed at an all-time high uh, for the S&P 500, which was up today 28 basis points. The NASDAQ was up barely 14 basis points. So it was an odd day. You had energy as the top performing sector uh, up 1.31%, but oil was actually down a tiny bit. Oil was up earlier in the morning a little bit, but it closed down um, a few cents. uh, So about half a percentage point from where it had been. And that's a little bit of a surprise to some who we're going to talk in a moment on some of the news events but are paying attention to what is clearly escalating volatility in the Middle East. Didn't move oil prices, but the energy sector performed well today. Healthcare was the worst performing sector, and it was only down a quarter of a point. But when we talk about the S&P making a new all-time high, only 32% of semiconductor companies are even above their own 200-day moving average. 68% of semiconductors are below their 200-day moving average. The large cap 1000, the Russell 1000 technology sector, it's about 50-50 of the companies that are below and above their 200-day moving average. That is a very high dispersion of return, um, a very non-monolithic reality within the tech sector right now, that there are some doing real well, some not very mixed bag. But that the market is holding up with this kind of democratic support that is not as top heavy as it had previously been is of encouragement. And I would argue a little bit of a surprise um, as tech is clearly not holding things up at this at this point. Um, I've always made a distinction, by the way, a very important one between big tech and shining objects. The shiny object craze is meant to be a catch-all pejorative term for things that are bought because they are popular and fun and exciting. And that can include big tech at different times. And there's been er periods where it did. But um, it is shiny objects are a lot broader than one particular area and certainly much broader than one area that happens to be, you know, a a monumental money maker in terms of real life corporate profits. Uh, I think of the most recent golden era of shiny objects is the 2020 to 2022 period where you just had an avalanche of companies that were somewhat equivalent to the late 90s dot com era in, in terms of either being money losers no path to making money or made money, but it was so unbelievably separated from the way the company had been valued that it was, it was just cartoonish. Um, I have a link in dividend cafe this week about 23 and me, which was a company that went public through a SPAC in this era. And at one point had a $6 billion valuation. It right now has a $7 million valuation, but that's a little deceiving because it has $7 million of cash in the bank. So it has a $0 valuation on the enterprise. I, um, and that's a brand name. That's a, that's a known company that, you know, had a product, had a brand, had a, had a whole buzz. Um, 
shiny objects impede people's ability to see. By definition, the shininess gets in the way of sound investment decision. And the more companies end up in the graveyard of the shiny objects of that era, hopefully the more illustrations we have. First of all, for me to every now and then make jokes and make fun of things, but probably even more important than that, um, to learn uh, a lesson in in insanity uh, and, from, and, and to avoid you know the temptation next time around. By the way, there is a school of thought that says you know value is enhanced when prices come down, but of course that presupposes that the company has staying power and and profits and certain fundamentals that when you have a certain valuation on fu solid fundamentals and price comes down, value is inversely related to that. And that is uh, axiomatic and true. Um, when a company is going from six billion to zero in market cap, the lower the value, the lower the price, the greater the value is not necessarily apply. That's a kind of permanent problem with those shiny objects, eh? Um, okay, so the 10-year bond yield today closed at 3.75%. Uh, the yield was up two basis points on the day. Um, and I mentioned already the top and bottom performing sectors for the day. The one other thing I want to throw out, um, banks represented 30% of corporate debt. Banks had originated 30% of corporate debt just you know, 15, 17 years ago, right around the time of financial crisis. It now is vacillating between 15 and 20 percent. Um, that's a massive amount of market share for non-financial corporate debt that has gone from commercial banks to somewhere else. And in this case, the somewhere else is almost entirely private credit. Now, that stat doesn't even share with within the non-bank lenders how much has gone from the high yield bond market to private credit. So the ongoing market opportunity in private credit, the advantages to investors, advantage to borrowers, advantages to issuers, um, and where the risks are for each of those parties, it's a subject that's incredibly important to us. And I will point out, we have our annual Money Manager Week uh, here in New York City next week, where um, my Brian Seitel, myself, Kenny Molina, will be meeting our uh, with, as we do every year with all of our major uh, portfolio managers and asset management partners, and we will be meeting with three of the the major players in the private credit space. And this is an area of conversation we'll be talking more about. All right, I mentioned the um, top news stories. Obviously, this Israel Hezbollah matter is continuing to escalate. Uh, Israel uh, attacking um, more and more uh, uh, effectively, and, shall we say, and those airstrikes continuing. The Pentagon today announced that they are moving uh, more U.S. troops into the region, a dozen warships, uh, uh, fighter jet squadrons. So there is the appearance of an escalation and the preparation for potentially more escalation taking place there. As I pointed out, the oil price is not reflecting that whatsoever. There had been, you know, a little bit in the most disingenuous media corners in recent days and weeks of uh, uh, fear and trembling about a government shutdown. And I think it's hard these days for the media to continue that narrative because they're now like 64 times in and doesn't seem like they get the same traction on the 65th time that they did on the uh, 3rd and 4th and 10th. And, and so there's kind of a marginal utility at play. Uh, but nevertheless, you will be shocked to hear that Senate and House leaders came to an agreement last night and the White House will be expected to sign something by next Monday um, that essentially just punts uh, short-term funding through the election but not all the way into the spring of next year or even past inauguration. As it stands now, it would require some other additional funding uh, agreement uh, during the lame duck session of Congress after the election before the inauguration. Speaking of public policy, oh, by the way, that short-term funding agreement did not give the White House what they wanted in VA additional funding. They wanted like in another $12 billion. It also did not give the House Republicans what they wanted about further um, 
requirements on uh, proof of citizenship before voting. And, and so uh, both sides left that out of a short-term funding agreement. It did provide $230 million of additional funding for Secret Service. Okay. Um, on the presidential campaign front, President Trump today, big speech in Pennsylvania, making hay about wanting to block uh, Communist Chinese Party, Chinese Communist Party, excuse me, acquisition of U.S. farmland which depending on what sources you believe has become either a bigger thing than before or a, perhaps a very big thing. And um, the Biden administration announced that they are outlawing any use of Chinese software and internet connected U.S. automobiles, which is a lot of U.S. automobiles. So a couple different either proposed or actualized restrictions on China. And the other thing I want to bring up is it's on the political side, but because the outcome of the election has all these market and economic impacts, and I'm going to be talking about it, obviously, in our uh, uh, special Dividend Cafe this Friday about the election. But I had alluded earlier to the possibility that it, this was the last time I brought this up is when uh, President Biden was still in the race. And at the time, there was polling that indicated it was you know, very possible that President Trump was going to win uh, Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia, and President Biden was going to win Michigan, Wisconsin, and um, Pennsylvania. And then if the one congressional district in Nebraska by Omaha went to Trump, which it did in 2016, you'd end up at a 269-269 tie. If it went to President Biden, he would have won 270-268 in that scenario. Well, now you fast forward to where we are, and the Electoral College hasn't changed a lot. President, Vice President Harris is now the Democrat candidate. President Trump, you know, it's close in all the polls. The lead is not as big as it was when Biden was still in the race, but there's certainly a plausible case that, that Trump wins Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia, and there's a plausible case that Harris wins Pennsylvania, Michigan, or Wisconsin. If she loses Pennsylvania, it's very, 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 very likely that she's lost the election. And if she wins Pennsylvania, it's very, very likely that she'll win Michigan and Wisconsin as well. However, the Republicans are looking to pass legislation in Nebraska that would take away the congressional district attribution of their electoral college and that would cause them to vote the way 40 eight of the other states vote, um, the only other exception being Maine, which only has two congressional districts, uh, which would be, you know, winner take all, the way all 48 other states do it. And obviously in that scenario, President Trump would be winning Nebraska. So if they do go forward with doing that, it would end up very likely being if he carried the South and she carried the Rust Belt, a 270, 268, excuse me, excuse me, a 269, 269 tie. Uh, then it would go to the House of Representatives. So just do with that what you will. I mean, maybe she wins Georgia and it's all moot. Maybe he wins Pennsylvania and it's all moot. But a 269-269 tie is not at all impossible. And that's something to think about, um, along with like my face getting run over by a tractor, because that would basically be about equally uh, enjoyable for things. Okay, I'm going to move on. A rule of thumb I want you to keep uh, in mind here. When people talk about, well, we have a weakening economy, but a strong labor market, or vice versa, it's a strong economy, but a weakening labor market. The best interpretation is that they're talking about some ships passing in the night and that it's a transitory comment. It is fundamentally incoherent. There is no such thing as a strong economy of the weak labor market. A weak labor market is indicative and creative of a weak economy. There's no such thing as a weak economy of the strong labor market. If you have a strong labor market, companies are hiring, they're growing wages, then they're forward-looking and state and assessment of present conditions is strong enough. You're hiring because you're what? Producing more goods and services. That's called economic growth. So labor and the economy tautologically are connected together. And any attempt to believe that these things are separated 
is at best case a very short-term data reporting tracking uh, uh, comment. It is, it is not fundamentally possible. So now if you say that there's a certain moment in time where there's data that looks good in the economy and weak in labor, vice versa, the next sentence has to be, and so what's going to reconcile it? If there's weak labor, strong economy, is the economy going to be getting weaker at the next round of reporting or, or vice versa? And um, right now, I think that the mixed bag continues, but the notion that we would just end up having a weak economy of strong labor or a strong economy of weak labor is, is absurd on its face. Okay, that's almost like a vocabulary lesson. Housing starts picked up a bit in August, um, 1.35 million annualized, and it was 1.24 million in July. July was likely affected by Hurricane Burrow, if you remember. Um, permits reached a five-month high in August, and so new building permits hopefully are a leading indicator of more construction, more housing supply. Um, but sales of existing homes did decline uh, in August, two and a half percent, and that's an annualized rate. Uh, they're down 4.2 percent from a year ago, and a year ago they were down quite a bit. Um, the 30-year mortgage rate is now down about one percent from its high, um, but I think you're looking at a minimum of three percent that it needs to come down from its high for that to be a big factor in driving activity. So the conversation has gone from the Fed, will they, won't they, to uh, they're going to do 25 or 50 basis points. The futures market right now is pricing in about a 25% chance that you get two 25 basis point, two quarter point cuts between now and the end of the year. About a 25% chance that you get two half a point cuts between now and the end of the year. And then about a 50% chance, the highest probability you get one of each, another 75 basis points. Um, so whether it's November, December for 50, then 25, or vice versa, again, pretty irrelevant. I'm going to leave it there. A great question. Uh, I've asked TBG, how do investment decisions get made at the Bonson Group when you consider the so-called Buffett indicator, which is the total stock market capitalization uh, divided by GDP and, and that being an extreme high. And I made the uh, comment in my response that hopefully we would respond to it somewhere, somewhat similarly to how Buffett himself does. How his name got attached to this indicator is another story. But uh, for like one of the largest holders of stocks in the world and in world history, um, to be asked, you know, if this rule that is attached to his name indicates that we should be selling stocks, uh, he, he most certainly uh, holding the gazillions of uh, stocks that he holds would be a counter to that idea. Now, people could say, well, they've raised a lot of cash over Berkshire, but as a ratio of cash, they've always had a fair amount and don't really have a lot higher than normal in terms of the dollar level is higher because the full overall denominator is higher. But, you know, these in, I, if what we want is some validation that I think markets are expensive, you have it. I think based on a price to earnings ratio, there's no question that 21 times next year's earnings on the S&P is expensive and that the lion's share of that is captured in the technology sector. And I think you know how I feel about that. All right. There's a link. And against doomsdayism, uh, the first ever commercial spacewalk. So for those who are just so down about everything, just remember we're, we're, you know, like sending people for fun, not from the government, not from the military, not from a university, just commercial to walk in space. I sent the link in Dividend Cafe. Check it out. I'm going to leave it there. Um, Reach out with any questions. Get ready again for this Friday. Special election issue, Dividend Cafe. Very exciting. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And thank you for reading the Dividend Cafe. Mm -hmm.